Good morning, everybody. I'm Lindsay Riser in for Joe and Savannah. And right now on Morning News Now, bracing for turbulence. The busy holiday travel season is wrapping up. And this morning, millions of people are getting ready to fly home after ringing in the new year. This is Southwest faces more scrutiny over thousands of canceled Christmas time flights. So will the new year bring better luck for travelers? We'll bring you the latest. Lying in state this morning, history unfolding at the Vatican as thousands of people gather to pay their respects to Pope Emeritus Benedict. More on the plans for what's being called a simple, solemn and sober funeral. Variant concerns this morning, a warning from health officials about a new strain of COVID spreading across the U.S. What doctors want you to know as we enter year four of the pandemic. And honoring a legend, this morning tributes pouring in following the death of iconic newswoman Barbara Walters. A look back on her more than six decades on the air and why so many credit her for paving the way for female journalists. Good morning, everybody. We begin with the end of a chaotic holiday travel season. Things seem to be mostly back to normal in our nation's airports. But it seems Southwest Airlines will be feeling the effects and the backlash from last week's crippled operations for quite some time. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us now with the latest. Blaine, good morning. Well, Lindsay, good morning to you. That's right. You can see the Southwest line kind of growing here behind me. Uh, you know, over the weekend, Southwest apologized again to its passengers for the nightmare of last week and said that it's working to continue to stay on track and really thank them for their continued patience through all of this. Now, so far, they're starting the morning with about 130 or so cancellations. The airline says they are largely back on track, operating at their normal schedule, and that is crucial ahead of a very busy travel day ahead. With 2023 now officially underway, this morning, millions of Americans are heading home from the holidays, filling the skies and the roads on one of the busiest travel days of the year, the final bookend on a holiday season that was expected to see nearly 113 million travelers. It comes as the nation's biggest domestic carrier, Southwest Airlines, is still recovering from an unprecedented travel meltdown, canceling more than 15,000 flights during the holiday week, leaving thousands of passengers stranded and mountains of luggage unclaimed. Over the weekend, in a message to employees, Southwest CEO Bob Jordan promised the company will move forward with lessons learned, adding there will be immediate work to understand what happened. Now, even as the airline is back to normal operations, industry experts say the ripple effects are far from over. There are still thousands and thousands of travelers on Southwest who had their flights canceled and who need to be rebooked, reaccommodated. And so as a result, you are seeing Southwest flights going out extremely full. Experts say if you are heading to the airport today, expect a crowd. Air travel is up 14% over last holiday season. To help keep your travel plans on track, experts say get to the airport early. Try not to check luggage. And if you do, consider attaching a GPS tracker to the bag so you can monitor where it ends up. And finally, take a picture of the inside of your luggage to have proof for reimbursement in case your bag goes missing. And a note for those passengers who were caught up in the mess of last week. Southwest has promised to reimburse travelers who were stranded for things like hotels and meals. You can submit those receipts online. But there's another option to explore as well. Go back to the original credit card that you used to book your flight. Experts say that depending on the travel insurance or the, the types of things there, you could also possibly be entitled to some reimbursement from that avenue as well. Lindsay. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. If you're planning to travel today, will the weather cooperate? Let's go ahead and get a check at your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here now. Angie, good morning. Good morning, Lindsay. And the answer, if you're on the East Coast, is yes. It looks great from Boston down to Miami. The middle of the country and out west, we could have a couple of trouble spots, places like Kansas City, Dallas, Houston, where we could see some of those stronger storms developing into the afternoon hours. And out west, where over the past few days, they've just been dealing with storm after storm. So we're still going to see that action happening on the west coast. But let's talk about what's going on in the middle of the country, because we have this system working through that's not only bringing the severe storm potential to folks in the south, but it's also bringing some wintry weather that has prompted some winter weather alerts across much of the northern plains. Snow, heavy, uh, heavy rain as well as some ice accumulations for the northern parts of this system a little farther to the south. We'll see the potential for severe weather. And here's the bullseye uh, where you see that brighter orange. That's where we have the better chance of potentially some isolated tornadoes through the afternoon hours. Uh, this is the area that you're really going to want to stay connected weather wise 
place as we get into the afternoon. Tulsa is included in this. You can see it extends into parts of the Gulf Coast as well as Houston included. 18 million people. And again, the tornado threat is there along with the hail and the strong winds, strong damaging winds at that. How about the ice accumulation in the snowfall? So here's what the snowfall is, is set to look like. We're still going to have that system continuing to work out of the Rockies here through the day uh, and eventually impacting places like Nebraska and up into, into Minnesota. You'll notice these rain or these uh, snowfall amounts anywhere from six to nine inches rainfall that heavy as well. We'll see the potential for some flash flooding too. Looks like uh, some heavy rain possible for folks in Memphis through the day. And there's that ice accumulation. This is going to make it really rough to travel on the roadways, extending into parts of Michigan and as far south uh, as places like Nebraska and into Kansas. Now, as far as the winter alerts, we've seen the winter weather advisory, the watches, the warnings, those ice storm warnings, and that does include 14 million people. So just be aware of that. That's one storm. Now we got the other storm on the west coast, and that's where we're going to continue to see the heavy rain moving out. Not quite as much as what we dealt with over the weekend, but still anywhere from 5 to 10 inches has already fallen for folks on the west coast. So any added means that we're going to look for mudslides, flooding concerns, and we'll see maybe another inch, two inches possible along that California coastline, which of course they need the rain, but just not all at once. It'll stay gusty too, uh, and you can see the rain that they're expecting, mostly focused towards central and northern California, and again, uh, maybe a half an inch or an inch here by the time the day is done. How about the East Coast? Things feel like spring on the East Coast. 71 degrees for Nashville later today, uh, 50 degrees in Cleveland, Atlanta at 73 degrees, and mid-60s in Baltimore, and these temperatures aren't going away after today. They stick with us tomorrow and really through the rest of the, the work week. We'll see temperatures running way above normal, almost 30 degrees above normal in Chicago tomorrow. So it just tells you where we're at. A big temperature swing from what we were dealing with just last week. Uh, Buffalo ends up into the mid-50s by Wednesday. Washington, D.C. at 68 degrees and Raleigh at 71 degrees. That doesn't look bad either as we get into Thursday and Friday, mid to low 40s. It's pretty good for this time of year. Yeah, 30 degrees warmer in Chicago. Just incredible. Maybe some of that snow the shorts will be Buffalo broken too. out, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> over there for sure. Angie, thank you. Well, new this morning, actor Jeremy Renner is in the hospital after being injured in a serious snow plowing accident in Reno, Nevada. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins us now with the latest on how he's doing. Kristen, good morning. Hey, good morning, Lindsay. Yeah, this is apparently the result of one of those big storms hitting the Sierra and dumping snow this morning. We're learning more about what happened to Jeremy Renner, and he is apparently in a Reno area hospital in critical but stable condition. It's a beautiful morning walk. Avengers star Jeremy Renner, often seen on his Instagram enjoying winter weather at what he called his happy place, Lake Tahoe, Nevada. But today, the two-time Oscar nominee's love of the outdoors may have landed him in the hospital. Washoe County, Nevada, Renner's home for the past seven years, was hit with heavy snowfall in a New Year's Eve storm. In a statement, Renner's rep confirming to NBC News overnight that Jeremy is in critical but stable condition with injuries suffered after experiencing a weather-related accident while plowing snow. While it's not clear exactly what happened or what type of injuries he sustained, the incident was serious enough that authorities say a rescue flight was needed to get him to the hospital. Care flight is en route, but unknown if they can land in feet of snow. Although Renner shot to Hollywood stardom after the Hurt Locker in 2008 and later as superhero Hawkeye in the wildly popular and successful Marvel movie franchise, he still liked getting his hands dirty with construction and renovation projects. Often seen on social media operating heavy machinery like this massive snowplow and driving his Jeep doing donuts in the snow. He was even set to star in a new unscripted series for Disney Plus this year called Renovations, where he would help communities around the world using his handyman skills and love for renovation. It's unclear now if this accident will put those plans on hold. We do know that Renner was the only one involved in the accident, Lindsay, and that his family is now by his side as he recovers. Back to you. All right, Kristen, thank you so much. Now to the Vatican, where the faithful are lining up to pay their respects to Pope Emeritus Benedict, the former leader of the Roman Catholic Church, lying in state inside St. Peter's Basilica. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter is at the Vatican with the latest. Molly. 
Now, early this morning, the body of late Pope Benedict XVI was moved in private to St. Peter's Basilica. And as you can see, there's this huge line snaking around. It is moving quite quickly. We've been talking to people in line all morning. Now, Roman authorities estimate that some 30,000 people a day are going to try to get inside to pay their final respects before Thursday's funeral. This morning, hundreds lining up outside St. Peter's Basilica to pay their final respects to the late Pope Benedict XVI. New pictures showing Benedict lying in state inside the basilica, where his body will remain until Thursday's funeral. On Sunday, Benedict's body lay at rest in the Vatican City Monastery he called home for the last decade, and where he died early Saturday morning at the age of 95. Padre. Pope Francis will preside over his predecessor's funeral in St. Peter's Square, a situation that hasn't happened in more than 600 years. In his first Mass of the New Year, Francis paying tribute to a man who held a wildly different worldview, expressing gratitude, urging the faithful to join together with one heart and one soul. Benedict's complicated legacy, roiled by the Catholic Church's massive sex abuse scandal. A serious theologian, a powerful intellectual, a traditionalist who broke with centuries of tradition by retiring in 2013. I think it was widely understood that Pope Francis would not consider retirement uh, until his predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, had died. Uh, now that that has happened, you know, it, it's an open uh, guess as to what happens. Filippo Toso traveled from Venice on an overnight train to be one of the first in line. During his papacy, Filippo saw Benedict more than a dozen times. Christ uh, was the person he loved more in his life, uh, and now he, he is with him. And two and a half hours later, Filippo emerged. It was like uh, a, a, a meeting uh, with a, a friend, and it, uh, it touched my heart. Now, Filippo says once inside, it's incredibly emotional. You only have about 30 seconds to say your final prayers. Also, over the weekend, a letter was published, a spiritual testament that Benedict wrote back in 2006. And in it, he asks for forgiveness and encourages believers to stand firm in the faith. Molly Hunter, thank you. This morning, crews are working to restore power after an earthquake rocked parts of Northern California for the second time in less than two weeks. The New Year's Day earthquake had a preliminary magnitude of 5.4 and hit near the city of Rio Del. That's about 25 miles south of Eureka. The Humboldt County Sheriff's Office says the quake damaged homes and left half the city without power and around 30% without water. This comes just days after two people were killed when a separate earthquake hit the area. Now to the latest in the investigation into the murders of four Idaho college students. Tomorrow, the extradition hearing for the suspect in the killings, Brian Koberger, will take place in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, starting the process for his return to Idaho to face charges in connection with the killings. And this morning, the Moscow police chief is speaking out about where the investigation stands. Those answers will come out. Um, you know, we're sealed um, by what we can share right now, and that's a state law. And um, once we can uh, give that information, we will. What I can tell you is, is there's a lot of pieces that came together, obviously, and you will get to see those soon, hopefully. And uh, we get to see the, the pieces of the evidence that we pulled together to get to where we are today. We're also hearing from Koberger's family. They've released a statement saying they care deeply for the victim's families and they will support Koberger as they, quote, attempt to seek the truth and promote his presumption of innocence. Well, as we wrap up the holiday season, experts are predicting another wave of COVID infections. And they're specifically concerned about a new variant of Omicron, XBB.1.5, which currently accounts for about 40% of cases in the U.S. NBC News Medical Fellow, Dr. Ash Akshay Sayal joins us now with more. Doctor, good morning to you. Happy New Year and thanks for being with us. Let's talk about this new variant and what we know. Yeah, good morning and, and happy new year to you as well, Lindsay. Um, you know, this variant XBB.1.5, it, it, it's a name that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but you know, there is some concern here because this variant was newly discovered as being the most dominant variant in the US, meaning that, you know, most infections of COVID now are from this variant. But the reason we're concerned about it is because there's some there's some early data that's showing that, you know, our vaccines and those who've had infection and those who've recovered and have antibodies may not be as effective with this variant as it is with the other variants. Um, so that's really 
really the thing that we're watching for more. Uh, but as you as you pointed out, you know, a rise in cases is really inevitable. And what we're looking for is, is that rise in cases going to lead to a big rise in hospitalizations and deaths? Or is it going to be a little bit different this time, given that we have a lot of population immunity from all the people who've been vaccinated and all the people who've had an infection so far? So where in the U.S. is this becoming the most prevalent right now? So, so right now, it's actually the Northeast. The Northeast region, about you know 70 to 75 percent of cases are with this variant, um, compared to about 40 percent nationwide. Mm. Um, but you know, we talked to the CDC about this last week, and it's reassuring that you know in in the regions of the Northeast, we aren't seeing a greater than expected rise in hospitalizations. Now, the, you know, the caveat to that is it could take some time, and we could start to see that develop a little bit more. But as of now, it doesn't appear to be causing more severe illness. Everybody wants to know when a new variant pops up, will I be protected? We have the tools in our arsenal now, um, but, but that's not to say that eventually a variant couldn't emerge that could be uh, evasive essentially to the vaccines. What do we know right now about XBB 1.5? So, you know, we, we have a, we have data from a close cousin of it called XBB without the dot 1.5. And we're, what we're seeing is it is immune evasive, meaning that the antibodies that we have from infection, from vaccination aren't as effective as we would like. Now, the good news is that, you know, we're, we're hoping that protection from severe disease, meaning are you going to end up in the hospital? Are you going to end up in the ICU? We're hoping that protection is still intact because of all the immunity that we've built up, um, and including things like T cells, um, which are part of the immune system, apart from antibodies that don't often get a lot of credit. Um, so we, you know, while we are hearing the headlines that it is immune evasive, the most severe outcomes, we're hoping our protection stays, stays put. Okay, Dr. Akshay Sayal, thank you so much for joining us. Happy New Year. Some startling of findings this morning from a new study on hydration and your health. Researchers from the National Institutes of Health say not getting enough fluids may be linked to faster aging and higher risks for chronic diseases. The 25-year study tracked sodium levels in 1,100 participants as a proxy for hydration. Researchers found that the participants with high blood sodium levels aged faster than those with lower levels. However, some doctors aren't convinced and think most Americans are adequately hydrated and there are other factors at play. Well, there are new developments this morning in that violent attack during the New Year's Eve celebrations in Times Square. Three police officers are recovering after the suspect attacked them with a machete. Investigators are saying the suspect was on their radar because of jihadist writings online. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park has the latest. Just hours before the iconic ball drop in Times Square, a violent machete attack blocks away from the celebrations. Be advised, we have a male uh, MOS stab to the head in regards to West 528th Avenue. She can have a person in custody. Armed with this large knife, several law enforcement sources tell NBC News the suspect, 19-year-old Trevor Bickford of Wells, Maine, allegedly charged a group of NYPD officers at a security checkpoint just after 10 p.m. One officer... An eight-year veteran suffered a laceration, laceration to the head. Police say one of the officers eventually shot Bickford in the shoulder. <laughs> Meanwhile, revelers caught in the chaos captured the moments after the attack. They shot right in front of us and everyone in the line dispersed like crazy. Police quickly moved in to secure the scene. Oh Officials telling NBC News a suspect likely arrived in New York City via Amtrak on Thursday and had a backpack that included personal writings, terrorist propaganda, a pocket knife, and $200 in cash. They say in mid-December, he was interviewed by federal law enforcement after being alerted by a relative. FBI agents were seen at Bickford's family home, according to our NBC affiliate, News Center, Maine. Back in New York, police say there is no longer a threat. We believe this was a sole individual at this time. There's nothing to indicate otherwise. A violent act just moments before the new year for a city already battling a crime surge. All three injured officers were rushed to the hospital, but we've learned that as of Sunday morning, all of them have been released and are now recovering. Back to you. Now to Washington and the fight for leadership of the House this morning. Congress starts a new session tomorrow, and one of the first orders of business will be voting for a new Speaker of the House. Congressman Kevin McCarthy is vying for the top spot, but he's still facing an uphill battle, namely winning over some Republican lawmakers. In an effort to shore up some of those votes, he held a conference call last night with GOP lawmakers to discuss a House rules package and some of the compromises he's willing to make. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now. So, Ali, what's it looking like here? 
Yeah, Lindsay, well, you and I spoke yesterday when uh, the reports of that call, that 4 p.m. call uh, McCarthy had yesterday, was confirmed really to iron out uh, and, and lock in this every last ounce of support among House GOP members. And it's not looking like that was the case coming out of that call because last night we saw nine House Republicans release this letter saying that McCarthy hasn't done enough to win over their support. That's in addition to five House Republicans who have publicly opposed McCarthy. So right now the numbers are just not looking uh, like they're in McCarthy's favor because after all, with this slim majority by Republicans in the House, we know that he can only afford to lose four votes and still reach that magic number of 218 to win the speakership during uh, tomorrow's election. So you can only imagine how uh, much McCarthy and his team will be working the phones here today trying to get every last ounce of support before this make or break moment tomorrow. Yeah, I got to be quick with you here. What, what compromises, what concessions is he willing to make at this point. So there are a couple concessions that were laid out in this rules package uh, released last night. Things like uh, lowering the threshold for something called the motion to vacate. Basically, uh, lowering the threshold, allowing only five House Republicans to force a vote to remove the speaker. That's something that's already putting that's putting an already vulnerable McCarthy in an even more precarious position if he does win the speakership. Uh, other things like removing uh, the uh, metal detectors from outside the House chamber put in place on January 6th. Uh, some sort of some other concessions that uh, McCarthy is promising if he does uh, win the speakership election tomorrow, Lindsay. Hmm. All right, busy day ahead for you, Ali. Thanks so much. Coming up on Morning News Now, Russia on the offensive and using drones to target key infrastructure in Ukraine. We'll bring you the latest on the stepped up attacks coming up next. Welcome back. Overnight, Russian forces stepped up their offensive in Ukraine using drones to attack key infrastructure, killing at least one civilian. NBC News foreign correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from Kyiv with the latest. So, Matt, what's it like there today? Yeah, I mean, this has been typical. So this is not really a standout day. And actually, uh, you know, I just spoke with the spokesman for Ukraine's air forces, and he described what they're doing to counteract these drones and missile strikes. And you know, one of the interesting things that he mentioned, because I asked him, when is Russia going to run out of these drones and of these missiles? And he said they really are scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Those drones that you mentioned, they're Shahed drones. That means uh, uh, that, um, you know, the Ukrainians believe they were sourced from Iran. So the fact that the Ukrainians are continuously going to Iran, a country that does not have a powerful conventional military, though these drones are you know, used to great effect here, just goes to show how little they have in terms of resources. Now, the missiles as well. The, the, the Air Force spokesman told me that a lot of these missiles were ones that had been produced after the invasion started back on February 24th. So it's clear that Russia does have some capacity to continue producing these missiles even as they're lobbing them daily, on a daily basis. Now, we did get about a two-week reprieve uh, just a couple of days ago before we had what is now the fifth straight day of comprehensive missile and drone attacks across the country. That indicated that Russia might have been having some problems restocking their supply of missiles, but now we're seeing that tempo just continuing on a daily basis. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in the eastern part of the country, in the Donbass region. We just saw another big incident where, according to the Ukrainians, 400 newly mobilized Russian troops, now these are troops that have just been taken, just been recruited into the Russian military, were killed in a strike by a HIMARS uh, weapon system. That's a U.S.-made multiple rocket launcher weapon system against what looks like a trade or a vocational school in the town of Makivka in the eastern part of the country. They said 400 Russian troops had been killed in what sounds like a Ukrainian strike. Now, the Ukrainians did not explicitly claim this, which they often don't do that. They don't always claim every strike, but it's obvious, of course, that they were the ones who did it. The Russians themselves acknowledged the attack, but put that number of casualties much, much, much lower. Lindsay? Matt, Ukrainian forces have been trying to fortify utilities ahead of the holiday. Have they been success successful? Well, it's not necessarily fortifying the utilities. They're trying to keep the lights on. They have to run around and, you know, repair these things after they get struck. And I have to say, once again, there was another round of blackouts. Power was once again out in the capital and other cities because these drones and these missiles are specifically targeting the electricity infrastructure. 
But, you know, when we hear from President Vladimir Zelensky, he regularly congratulates the electricity, the municipal workers who really have become kind of like frontline people. You know, they have to go out uh, in the middle of the night and rush to turn the lights back on or repair broken pipes. We see them all over the place. Um, and, you know, this has been an exhausting effort for them, but one that ultimately, when you consider the pressure being applied by the Russians and the frequency of these attacks, they have been relatively successful. Lindsay? Matt Bradley, thanks so much. Now for a look at what else is making headlines around the world this morning. Brazilian soccer legend Pele's funeral is set for today. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez joins us now with more. Raf, good morning. Lindsay, good morning. That's right. Pele's funeral begins today at the stadium for the Brazilian team Santos, where he played for nearly 20 years. It's a fitting place to say goodbye. Pele scored more than 600 goals for the team. The public funeral will take place today and tomorrow, followed by a private burial. And Brazil's new president will attend his first official engagement since taking office Sunday. In Mexico, dozens of inmates have escaped from a prison after a suspected drug cartel opened fire on the facility. The attack took place in Ciudad Juarez, and the gunmen used armored cars to assault the prison. Police say around 14 people were killed in the fighting, and at least 24 inmates escaped. A major manhunt is now underway. And finally, if you're planning a New Year's diet in Edinburgh, Scotland, you might want to wait a little longer. That's because a local pizza shop owner is planning to give everyone in the city a free pizza over the next month as an act of kindness. Mark Wilkinson of Pure Pizza says folks will just have to provide a cell phone number to get their pie. But, Lindsay, no word on whether you get to pick your own toppings or if it's just going to be cheese for everybody in the city. But it's pretty good either way, hey, right? I I wouldn't say no to a free pizza. I'm looking at flights right now to Edinburgh. Definitely not. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Legendary journalist Barbara Walters died over the weekend, leaving behind a long list of career achievements. She began that career right here at NBC, working as a writer for Today in 1961. Walters later made history, becoming the first woman to ever anchor an evening news network show at ABC. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander takes a look back at her most iconic moments. It was her innate ability to get to the heart of a question. Your Highness, I must ask you the question that most Americans want to know about you. Are you happy? And her competitive grit to get the interview that made Barbara Walters a pioneer, oftentimes asking the questions many wouldn't dare. You showed the President of the United States your thong <sighs> underwear. Where did you get the nerve? Barbara is with me. For more than five decades, she was a force on television, grilling everyone from U.S. presidents. Are you sorry you didn't burn the tapes? Yes, I think so. To movie stars. <laughs> an interview in which you said, uh, not the worst thing to slap a woman now and then. As I remember, you said you don't do it with a clenched fist. It's better to do it with an open hand. Mm. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't love that. And everybody in between. I'm just a normal kid. Oh, Eric, you're a normal kid who killed your parents. Walters didn't just break barriers, she demolished them. I'm Barbara Walters of the NBC News Center here in New York. In 1974, she became the first female co-host of Today. Two years later, ABC made her the first woman to anchor an evening news broadcast. In those days, nobody thought it was possible. A celebrated milestone, though not by her male co-anchor. Harry Reasoner did not want a partner. If he was going to have a partner, he certainly didn't want me. He didn't want someone without that, quote, hard news background. And he certainly didn't want a woman. But I've kept time on your stories and mine tonight. You owe me four minutes. <laughs> Still, she continued to rise and shine, scoring interview after interview through her primetime specials and as host of 2020. Always wanted to do a show with uh, different generations of women with different backgrounds. In 1997, Walters created The View. Do you really think that being on the show with a bunch of women, five women, who never <laughs> shut up is going to be calming? That is the... Uh, look, I was trying to find a show that Michelle actually watched. <laughs> But perhaps her greatest legacy, forging a path for so many female journalists to follow. We all proudly stand on your shoulders, Barbara Walters. That's why on her final appearance on The View... Jay Foley, Gail King, 
one by one, they came to say thank you. Those tributes continued today. President Biden praising her as an example of bravery and truth, breaking barriers while driving our nation forward. Oprah wrote, I did my very first television audition with her in mind the whole time. From Savannah Guthrie, thank you, Barbara. You showed the way. And from Andrea Mitchell, she became a mentor and a friend to me and so many others fortunate enough to know her. I didn't start out to do it to prove anything. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to be the biggest or the best. But for the many who watched, that's exactly what she was. This is my legacy. These are my legacy. And I thank you all. And Barbara Walters, we thank you for your trailblazing spirit and your unquenchable curiosity that informed a nation. Blaine Alexander, NBC News. Coming up, new year, new laws, new controversy. We'll run through some of the most talked about pieces of legislation now in effect in several parts of the country. And a prosperous new year. Financial influencer Vivian Tu joins us next with tips on how to meet your money goals in 2023. You're watching Morning News Now. Dozens of new laws kicked in yesterday around the country. From gun protection to fur production, millions of Americans are starting their year with a new state order. NBC News Justice correspondent Ken Delanian takes a closer look at who is impacted by the changes. Anyone shopping for a new mink coat in California will soon be out of luck. That state will become the first to ban the sale and production of most products made from animal fur. Let's call it what it is, a barbaric kill for no purpose other than vanity. The law bars residents from selling or making fur clothing, shoes, or handbags, though it doesn't apply to leather, used items, or those used for religious or tribal purposes. California is also repealing a law this year against jaywalking. Under the Freedom to Walk Act, pedestrians may cross the street outside of an intersection without being ticketed as long as it's safe to do so. Before, jaywalkers in California could receive a fine of up to $198. In Kentucky, the so-called Get Back to Work law will significantly restrict eligibility for unemployment benefits. Supporters say it's needed to help employers fill vacant job openings. I can tell you as a small business owner, we, we cannot find help. Critics say it will hurt struggling residents. In Michigan, the state will begin automatically expunging people's criminal records after seven years for misdemeanors and 10 years for felonies, unless the crimes are really serious. It's in response to concerns that people are being unfairly denied employment over minor offenses. Alaska is changing what it means to consent to sex in that state. The previous law required a use of force to prove sexual assault. Now, consent must be positively expressed by word or action. If at any point what you're doing doesn't feel comfortable, you can change your mind. And that is okay. That is your right. Alabama will no longer require a permit to carry a concealed handgun, becoming one of 31 open carry states. The new law also allows gun owners over 21 to take their firearms into state parks without the written permission previously required. <laughs> And back in California, a new law makes the Lunar New Year a state holiday. Important in Asian American communities, the day falls between January 21st and February 21st, marking the first new moon. Ken Delanian, NBC News, Washington. Well, if one of your resolutions this year is to tackle your finances, you are not alone. According to a survey conducted by Fidelity, 43% of Americans say saving more money is their number one goal for 2023, making it the top resolution this year. 41% of Americans also said they want to pay down their debt. We have some tips to help you conquer some of your biggest money goals. Let's bring in Vivian Tu for more. She's the CEO and founder of Your Rich BFF. So Vivian, good morning here. Um, very interesting that this is the top resolution. A lot of people have been forecasting a potential recession for months. This year, uh, last year, obviously we saw high inflation, interest rate hikes, coupled with the cost of the ongoing war with Ukraine. All of this having an impact on our wallets. So how can people prep their finances, including saving? for a possible economic decline. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, this may be a good time to really beef up your emergency fund. Uh, typically, I recommend having three to six months of living expenses on hand, but given that we are likely facing a recession and people are already starting to feel some of the impacts, Try your best to get to six to nine months of living expenses. Additionally, uh, I know you guys had mentioned just a little bit earlier that there are certain social trends that are happening right now, like dry January or a health kick. Um, and we all know that things like spirits, liquor, eating out with friends can be incredibly expensive. And this is a time in the year when you have the perfect excuse to not only detox your body, but also your budget. And no one's really gonna think twice about why you don't wanna be spending a lot of money on a bar night out. So. Take advantage of these moments to budget and save as much as you possibly can, knowing that there may be some rough waters ahead. So Vivian, when you say six to nine months, I mean, that can feel really daunting for people when everything is so expensive. But I'm getting the sense that you're saying, you know, that one night out at the bar could make a big difference. I mean, what are the practical tips here for how to get there? And also, if people have that credit card debt, they're paying really high interest rates right now. How can we better manage our credit card use? Yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, a credit card is a tool and we need to try our best to be as responsible as possible with this tool. So we want to do everything in our power to pay our credit card bill in full. That said, credit cards are also a really, really great opportunity to get cash back, rewards, points, perks on everything that you are spending. So all of that money that we spent on gifts at the end of 2022 can likely mean cash back and travel perks for early 2023. So instead of spending your hard earned dollars on that flight, use your points because that's not going to come directly out of your pocket, directly out of your bottom line. And by doing that and saving that money, you'll be able to put that towards your emergency fund. And last but not least, I'm not going to name any names, but a lot of us did have some issue with some airlines this holiday season. So just double check with your credit card company, as a lot of them do have trip insurance for prepaid expenses that you may have occurred because your plans got disrupted. Absolutely, we should not be coming out of pocket for those things. Okay. Those are dollars that should be going towards our emergency fund. Good point there. All right, I got to tell you, I am a hardcore budgeter. Like, literally, if I pay for a bus ticket, I'm putting it in my, like, Google <laughs> Sheet uh, for, for my transportation bucket. But I realize that not everybody's going to be like that. In fact, that, that, that's probably, like, way more than anybody can actually do. What are some of the middle ground ways that people can still shop, enjoy life, do what they want to do without spending every dime. Yeah, my favorite method, if, you, if you've never tried budgeting before, is the 50-30-20 method. It's the easiest budgeting strategy out there. Essentially what you want to do is try and get your expenses as close as possible to these three numbers. 50% of your income going to needs, so things like your rent or your mortgage and basic groceries. 30% going towards wants. These are your trips to the nail salon, going to dinner out, getting drinks with friends, and 20% going to saving, paying down debt, and investing. And if you can roughly get your numbers around these percentages, you'll be in a pretty good spot in terms of your budget. See, I thought I knew all there was to personal finance. I'm going to go look at my Google Sheet, Vivian, and I'm going to see if it's 50, 30, 20. Thank you so much for the inspiration. Appreciate you. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We finally made it to 2023, but one university thinks a few words need to be left behind in 2022. The faculty at Lake Superior State University released their annual banned words list with a list of overused or useless words that need to be banished. More than 1,500 nominations came in this year. Number one on the list, GOAT. That's the acronym for greatest of all time. Some other words that made the list include gaslighting, amazing, quiet quitting, and the phrase, it is what it is. I use all of these, by the way. Oh, well. We end this hour with a story of four sisters who have bonded over their love of music. Boyd Hoopert from our NBC affiliate in Minneapolis shares their story of how their friendship and talents bring smiles to everyone around them. If we told you that beautiful music you're hearing is coming from a woman in her 80s, you likely wouldn't raise an eyebrow. At a second octogenarian, and it's a duet you might not ignore. But this is a story about 80s music. 
times four. I'm Jan Doris. I'm 80 years old. Val Donick, 81. I'm Carol Hall, and I'm 83. Vicki Hall, 88. It's not just the ages, hairstyles, and vests that sets them together. The Bonama sisters from Princeburg, Minnesota. Sisters tied his piano strings then and still. They are very advanced piano players. Jennifer Ackland is the music therapist at Vicky's Senior Complex, who offered up her pianos for practice. It's wonderful. But this isn't just a sister act. Jan and Val and Carol and Vicky could be role models for family harmony. I am closer to any of my sisters than any of my friends. Vacations together, coffee together, hot tubs and slumber parties. Our love exceeds any differences that, that we might have. And one and two. Yet only once for their mother's 90th birthday party so, have they played together publicly. Only once until now. Well, welcome everyone. At Orchard Path Senior Community, the closest of sisters seem to also have a knack for bringing everyone else together. Plenty of grandmas have attended their grandchildren's piano recitals. She's my, She's grand my grandchildren. Isn't it nice to see the tables turn? This holiday season, there is joy in numbers. Eight hands, 40 fingers, and 80s ladies. Boyd Hooper, NBC News. All right, that does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.